Welcome to Wales Tech Week 2021. Thank you to our partners. Enjoy the session. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the main stage of Wales, fin of Wales Technology Week. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be looking a little bit into fintech, how fintech and financial services drive innovation, and some of the trends that we're going to look at um, for the future. So my name is Oliver Heyman. I'm the head of customer delivery for Amplify. Amplify is a deep tech startup that makes sense of unstructured data. So unstructured data in our case is text data. So really at our core, we're a text analytics company. We're headquartered in Cardiff here in South Wales, um, but we have operations and customers throughout the globe, notably in the United States and Asia. So in today's session, um, I'll be talking a little bit about what Amplify has learned about innovation in financial services. Um, and this really comes from our own work with financial services organizations um, in, in, as a provider of technology into, the, into those, those organizations, um, and also from our own research. So Amplify is very, very interested in innovation, what drives innovation, and what the trends are in this space. Um, so really this presentation is driven by those two things, our own experience and our own research actually using Amplify technologies. So just to begin, I'll give you a very quick overview of Amplify technology and some of our, some of our tools and products. And this slide really outlines our core technology quite succinctly. So I mentioned before that we analyze unstructured text data. So that process really starts with finding text to analyze. And for this, for us, this means harvesting content from the surface and from the deep web. But we can also point our technology at, at internal data sets, um, knowledge libraries, and document repositories. Once we've found the documents and the, the unstructured text that's useful, we machine read all of this content using our machine learning algorithms. And this allows us to analyze the entire corpus of documents of interest. And we turn this raw data, this raw unstructured data into something more useful. So in Amplify Tools, we extract key topics, we extract key entities, so things like companies, governments, people, and locations, and we understand how all of these are connected. Once we've done that, we can then move to more advanced analytics. So this is things like underlying, understanding the underlying company activities, we can analyze investment events, we can analyze risk, we can analyze adverse media, sentiment, and more. And the key thing is that the more we analyze, really the smarter we get. And this is a quick visual representation of what this looks like in practice. So this is a real example of a piece of analysis that we did on biofuel cells. And you can see really how the machine reading works. So we start to extract the topics and entities, as I mentioned, and then we can use these as building blocks for our more advanced analysis. It's really important to state that we don't just do this across one single document. We do this across millions of documents on virtually any topic of interest. And this allows us to generate huge data sets, analyze trends, monitor for change and disruption, and turn all of this into actionable insight. So who do we work with? Here's a selection of some of our customers. Um, and as you can see, they are, come from a broad range of industries and sectors. Um, we've worked with some major financial institutions, and we've seen firsthand how they approach innovation and working with companies like ours. And as I mentioned, that's some of the things that we're going to share with you today. But all of these companies really have one thing in common. They recognize that they need to have the right information at the right time in order to make strategic decisions so they can execute change. And this really ties in to our North Star vision. So Amplify, Amplify helps organizations change with conviction for a better future. And we think that the core building block of that is having the right information at the right time. Okay, so what does all this mean for financial services, fintech, and innovation? Well, these organizations are all facing an existential challenge, and it centers around digital disruption. So since 2000, 
52% of Fortune 500 companies have either gone bankrupt, been acquired, or ceased to exist as a result of digital disruption. 52%, that is an absolutely astonishing number. And it means that in order to survive this period of change, you have to be really, really smart. And here's some of the threats that organizations in financial services, but outside of financial services as well, are facing. Um, and I, I expect many of you on this call are wrestling with one or several of these fundamental macro trends that have the potential ultimately to sink your business. But what we want to explore is how financial services and fintech companies navigate these dynamics. Um, and before we dive into that, um, we'll just touch on some of what I mean by some of these, these some of these high level trends and, and changes. So technical innovation, um, this is really a catch all theme, if you like, for any um, innovation that relates to improvements or changes in technology. So digital transformation, um, pretty much fundamentally driven by technological innovation. And I think this is actually what a lot of people think of when they think of innovation. Um, but there's other types of innovation as well, as we'll see. But technological innovation is really a core dominant trend in this space. Competitive threats. So what are our, what are our competitors doing? How are, they, how are the markets evolving and how are they adapting? New entrants and disruptors. This is particularly pertinent, I think, for financial services and fintech. Um, so we've all seen the rise of the challenger banks. We've all seen the rise of um, different technologies that have completely changed the traditional banking processes um, of, of the last century. And this is really important for this space. Regulatory change. This is another thing that is um, sometimes, you know, underplayed or not as understood as well as as those who are not in the industry. But regulatory change, particularly in the context of financial services, is a huge driver and something that all organizations have to be incredibly aware of and, and stay on the front foot with regards to changes that come down the track. The final two then are really some of the key trends that I think are emerging in this century and I think trends that are going to be prevalent for years to come. Um, they are changing consumer trends um, and purpose-led innovation. Um, and we can we can do a bit more of a deep dive on some of those um, in subsequent slides. But I think these are these are really two important strands that have become apparent to amplify both through our work with these companies and also through our own research in this space. So moving on to the next slide, I mentioned our own research in this space, and this is just what I'm going to cover um, very, very briefly, because I think it gives a good foundation and a good context for this conversation. So Amplify used our own product, Deep Insight, to conduct a scan and an analysis on the global innovation um, trends. This was not specific to, to financial services, but it was across all sectors. However, as we'll see, there were some specific learnings for financial services that came out of it. So this is what we did. We ran an analysis um, on over 50,000 documents, documents from um, really high quality gold standard sources um, that were highly relevant for this area of study. We estimated that it would take over five years of human reading time um, to, to read all of these documents in full. And that's reading 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so you can see why it's convenient to let a machine do this work for you. Um, and we discovered a huge amount um, from this analysis, um, not least of which over 30,000 unique entities were discovered. That was things like governments, people, locations, um, companies, regulatory bodies, startups, and everything in between. So that was the context of the study. And this is one of the um, what, this is one of the, the the kind of core insights that we drew from it. So. Within the global innovation sphere and global trends, technological innovation is an incredibly prevalent innovation type. It's the bedrock of digital disruption transformation. And really over the last 10 years, it's been, it's been the dominant, the dominant uh, part of the discussion. Technological innovation is incredibly closely linked to sectors like fintech and financial services and also other sectors like mobility. So this was quite a novel finding for us. We didn't set out to find a connection between fintech and innovation. This is what the machine analysis uh, led us to. So there's incredible links between these macro themes around innovation, around technology change, digital disruption, and sectors like fintech and financial services. So this is essentially an unbiased assessment um, of some sectors that are highly linked to these, to these themes. And this really led us to think, what is it about financial services 
that is drawing this connection? And what is it about financial services that might be driving innovation or activities in this area? Um, so we, we put a lot of thought into this and really it's been backed up by this analysis, as I say. Um, and we also have a lot of experience working with the customers directly. Um, so we put the two together to try and come up with some kind of sensible assessment of, of, of why the, that connection had occurred. But before we dive into that, I did want to show you this slide. This slide looks at the top 10 centers of innovation globally, as presented by our, the Amplify study. And as you can see, it also lists the key topics, industries, and themes that are connected to each of these locations. So looking, it might be a bit difficult for you to see if you're on a small screen, but the purple highlights that I've put there are financial services. And these are common across six of the top 10 innovation centers globally. And this is by far the leading industry um, out, of, out, of all of these, out of all of these locations. So some other industries that had close connections with innovation and these centers in particular were things like life sciences that was connected to California, Beijing, and Shanghai. The public sector, um, which was connected to Singapore and Dublin particularly strongly. Um, but really, no other, no other industry was, was connected across more than three locations. And like I say, financial services covers six of the 10. So already from this analysis, financial services is coming up incredibly strongly, not only as a driver as the macro theme of, of innovation and technological innovation, but also as being closely connected to global innovation centers. And as I say, this really got us thinking, what is it about fintech and financial services that is driving performance in innovation? There's a number of things that we've concluded from this. The first is that they are well-funded with budgets allocated and available to spend. So large financial institutions are very well-resourced and they are typically willing and able to fund POC projects. They will often have centralized innovation teams that are tasked with doing justice. They'll have budgets, they will be able to go out to the market, discover what new companies or what new technologies are being deployed or might be able to be deployed. And they're willing to invest in projects to try and realize that value. The second point that, we, that, we've, that we've discovered is that they possess an appetite for risk. They're, they are willing to experiment and they're willing to fail. And this requires a distinct mindset and a culture that is very, very difficult to acquire and sustain without real dedicated effort. And actually it comes organization wide. This is one of the key differentiators I think for players in this sector versus other sectors. Um, Amplify knows from its conversations with a range of different industries and, and stakeholders and people that we could do business with, that often an appetite for risk is what separates people from being interested and kicking the tires on a technology like ours versus actually moving to paid proof of concept projects and ultimately becoming customers. And I think this is a, this is a really important differentiator for this sector. The next one is they have a relentless focus on utility and by extension, return on investment. If you're a startup listening to this, do not turn up to a major bank or financial institution and pitch a cool idea that essentially amounts to nothing more than a curiosity or something interesting. Unless you have a solid idea of where the utility lies, that will probably be a wasted conversation. And this is something that amplifiers learned through many years of dealing with these organizations. What this actually does is it tends towards real world impact, um, incremental improvements and gains. Um, and sometimes that can come at a cost of, you know, paradigm shifts. So I don't think there's, you know, a huge, it's not a be an Uber to use the obvious examples that have been spun out of a financial services firm or the, that have necessarily you know, made an impact from the financial services organization. So our findings are that they tend to be incremental improvements that focus on improving their business processes. Of course, they'll move into new markets occasionally, but in terms of the paradigm shift, this focus doesn't necessarily allow for that. The final point that I wanted to raise is that they find innovation at source. So very many organizations and financial services will run competitive programs for leading startups. So that's things like accelerators or, or partnerships or um, paid POC opportunities. These are really interesting because they allow the organizations to be connected to what's going on in the ground. 
it allows the organization to scan the horizon for promising innovations and promising companies that might help them to improve their processes and achieve their goals. And this strategy often allows them to gain early access, advantage access to these solutions, which actually means that they can adopt them or test them out at a low cost. And if they can see something that they really like or where they think that they can prove the value, then they might be able to bring those solutions in-house, either as customers or in rarer circumstances through acquisition, if it's incredibly well aligned to what that organization is doing. So it's really the combination of these factors, I think, that are that are that are differentiate and really help drive performance and innovation for fintechs and financial service um, institutions. Um, and I think if you're uh, an organization looking at not in this sector, perhaps these are some of the behaviors that you might be able to adopt um, on your innovation journey. Okay, this next slide is really just um, building on our experience in financial services um, and understanding, now we understand the characteristics of what makes innovation tick in these organizations, how can we capitalize on them? Um, and this is some insight that's come from, you know, years of Amplify working with these projects, working on these projects with these people. So this is just a typical um, kind of schematic of how we might approach a kind of project, knowing what we know about financial services organizations. So all I've got is a simple plot of a chart here. Um, I've got ROI on the y-axis and investment on the x-axis. And the first and often overlooked step is to establish a baseline. Understand where you are, understand what the current state of play is, and only then will you be able to measure your improvements. The next step then is the pilot step. I think this is actually where a lot of, um, a lot of institutions get to quite quickly. My transitions are going wild. So the pilot step is where a lot of a lot of a lot of institutions get to, but not very many get beyond it. Um, the pilot step is really characterized by quite a small investment, but expecting a relatively small return on investment in return. So this is about finding, improving your use cases and measuring this, for example, with KPIs. And that's why the baseline is so important. You can't measure what you didn't know before. The third step, and I think this is really where the transition, there's, there's, an, there's, a, there's an inflection point on this third step. The third step is deployment. If you can get to deployment, then you're definitely doing something right. This represents a jump in investment, but also a jump in ROI. And the deployment step is really building on what is a proven concept with proven use cases. So you've proven that those are to, to be effective, and we can build a business case for further investment and rollout. If we can validate that business case, then there are major gains in terms of the ROI. And this is because we're scaling up adoption and we're likely to be providing utility and value across multiple users and even across multiple teams. So whereas in the pilot phase, we've gone from a very small, well-defined uh, concept and project, we're now scaling up. So we should expect to see multiplication of the ROI. The final step then is really beyond deployment. Um, and this, I think, should be the vision for all companies, you know, selling into large organizations for all startups. And this is really characterized by an increase in investment. We may be up to the millions of pounds now and a corresponding increase in the ROI. So in the final stage, we might be aiming for full scale adoption, whatever that means for your technology or solution. And we are realizing value not just across one team or a handful of teams, but across the entire enterprise. And this is the realm of truly transformational activities um, that help you to achieve a wider vision or, or introduce a completely new way of working. So this again is rarer still. The, 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 I guess the number of um, a number of suppliers into these companies that achieve the fourth step is diminishes. Um, as it, the number diminishes with each step on this on this journey. Um, but I think this should be the aim. And if you can get there, then you're doing something really special. And here's just a small example from Amplify's um, history um, of what, what can happen if this goes right. So it can lead you to really good things. And this is just um, one of Amplify's customers, NatWest Group, um, won credit portfolio of the year award. And they credited Amplify as one of the reasons that they were able to, to win this award. And like I say, this was a German, this was a culmination of a journey really for Amplify and NatWest, which started when Amplify joined the NatWest Accelerator program. Um, based at One Central Square in Cardiff City Centre back, I think, in 2016. So it can be really, it can be really powerful when you get this right. Okay. So what? How do we know about what's coming next? 
Here's some more outputs from our from our analysis, which looks at new trends coming through in the world of financial services and fintech, um, and how they relate to the dominant players in the industry. So this is just a very simple heat map. It's got the top 10 or so organizations that were thrown up as a result of this Amplify study. And across the bottom, you may not be able to see, so I've called them out on the bullet points on the left-hand side. Here's some of the key trends that we're looking at for the future. So the vast majority of these dynamics, frankly, will be to be familiar to all of us. But this is a quantified assessment of the connections with some of the, the nascent trends in the industry and how they're connected to some of the industry's biggest players. So some of the topics that I wanted to pick out, the first is digital transformation. So that's on the left hand most side. Um, and this is still dominating. It's still highly prevalent across all industry players. Next in is customer experience. And this is actually gaining um, an awful lot of traction. Just in from that is startups. They're right there and, and continue to be, to be an important part of this industry. Financial inclusion is another topic that's, that's really interesting. Um, so financial inclusion, and I think this really talks to the wider theme of purpose-led innovation that I mentioned at the beginning. Open banking, so this is obviously a, a regulatory um, impact, and I don't think we're anywhere near done with the influence of challenger banks and other things on traditional financial services organizations. And the final one I wanted to call out was customer expectations. So this is, again, I think related to the purpose-led innovation and, and becoming more customer-centric. And I think these are really two trends that are going to drive the next 10 years at least. Um, so how do financial services align their values and their business practices with the expectations of customers? From a practical point of view of you know, how easy is it to use their services to a much kind of wider fundamental philosophical point of view? Do they share the same worldview? Um, are they engaged in activities that their customers and their future customers um, would deem acceptable? And I think this is a this is a growing trend. And actually, there's another point that I've got just at the bottom here around UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that isn't called out specifically in this data visualization, but from our work on the innovation space, there's strong links across all elements of innovation to the to the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think that has really far-reaching um, implications. And if you look at the uh, situation here in Wales, we've got uh, similar or kind of um, associated uh, goals with the Future Generations Act, um, which is, I think, relevant to many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but I think you're going to see a cascade effect across many territories globally and across many industries from that. So it's, it's really worth highlighting that. The implications of all that and how all that's going to shake out is something that's going to be really fascinating in years to come. So just to begin to wrap up then, um, what we've talked through today is that digital disruption and innovation is an existential challenge. Um, so technological innovation is a major driver in this, um, but there's also many other things that we need to consider. Disruptions, changing environments, both consumer and regulatory, all of these things are really forcing change. Financial services and fintech are highly connected to these trends of innovation globally, and, they're, set, and they're, they're closely associated with certain innovation centers. So major cities or, or regions that have a high propensity for innovation um, and have a lot of economic activity in this space. Financial services companies themselves generally tend to be well-funded, have an appetite for risk, and a real focus on ROI and finding utility. They're also able to tap into innovation at, at source or very close to source. And these characteristics make them really, really well placed to navigate change because ultimately they have the right information at the right time. We know that navigating change is really, really difficult um, and engaging with the right people in the right way and hopefully finding pragmatic solutions to problems that can deliver long term value is one way that we can effectively do this. And we've seen from a look at the future trends and th how things are evolving, that the pace of change continues to accelerate. Customers is a key, as is purpose. And the final point I wanted to, to bring to the table is that Amplify is committed to helping all kinds of organizations, not just those who work within financial services, to understand the dynamics that are shaping their industries and to help them navigate these changes. So I'll finish again with our North Star vision which is that Amplify helps organizations change with conviction for a better future. 
not everybody is as well funded or has the resources and the and the reach and the scale or the prestige of financial services companies um, but we don't think that that should be a barrier to preventing um to preventing change from taking place um, and amplify is really on a mission as i say to help all organizations change with conviction and that's all i had thank you very much for listening I'm now just going to stop my share and hand over to Paul from Talent Ticker. So, Paul, hopefully you're here and you can hear us, um, and you're ready to take over. I am. Just wait for my uh, my screen to come in. There it is. Uh, okay, great. Well, thank you, Oliver. Uh, that was really insightful. Um, just to firstly introduce myself. So, I'm uh, Paul Webersby. I'm the managing director for Talent Ticker. Um, just to talk a little bit about my background. So I've, uh, in my previous role, I, I spent 16 years in a, in a leadership position, uh, providing um, uh, services into, into financial services. Um, uh, we worked for uh, a, a company that was uh, eventually acquired by LexisNexis Risk Solutions. Um, since then, I've, uh, I've joined a, a very innovative company called Talent Ticker that actually works uh, in the in the recruitment space, um, so I'll, I'll start by by telling a, a little bit about what we do, uh, and then I'll uh, I'll focus the the rest of the presentation on on fintech. So, Talent Ticker is uh, an organisation which is able to provide um, predictive insight into the hiring movements of a, of an organisation. Uh, we work right at the beginning of uh, of the sales funnel, so we are a, a pre sales enablement tool, uh, providing specific uh, insights into organizations uh, effectively providing um, leads uh, to to predict when a, a company might be uh, might be hiring um, we plan some further enhancements to our, our modeling which will allow us to to make the model more applicable to uh, to general sales and, and market research uh, so uh, adapting it to to predict um, uh, investment and uh, and divestment, um, but generally we we sit right at the beginning of the of the channel. Uh, what we do is is quite unique, and uh, I'll go into a bit more detail about how we uh, how we do it. So, firstly, I'd, I'd like to say the uh, the technology that we have is uh, is all developed right here in Wales. Uh, we're headquartered in uh, in Cardiff. It was uh, concepted in in Wales and uh, and developed here. So, the the technology that we have uh, will look at the the world's media. Uh, we collect anything in the region of uh, around about hundred thousand news articles every single day. But first part of the process is to to analyze the actual news that we have. So, the the thing that we're really interested in is looking at, at business news. We have a process that will determine whether the news we're looking at is uh, kind of more general news, maybe a, a weather uh, weather report, a uh, uh, indication of how sunny it will be in Wales this week, as an example, uh, through to what we're really interested in, which is uh, business news, which can kind of predict um, the uh, the outcome of a, of a company. We will, um, as the first stage of the process, kind of identify the, the entities. So we use uh, AI and uh, an NLP, natural language processing process, to event identify all entities within a particular article. So we're, what we're particularly interested in is understanding the, the company um, that the article is, is truly about, um, potentially any people that the article should mention, uh, anything such as contact information, values, numbers, uh, or statistics. We pull all of the entities out of the article before going on to the next step. Now, the, the next step is what I think is what truly kind of sets us apart and allows us to do a lot of uh, a lot of what we, we do next. So we're able to understand the, the context of the article. So uh, for a, a completely machine-driven process, uh, we're able to to understand whether the, the article we're looking at is, for example, a funding round, a key person change, a regulatory activity, or, or many, many more. We, we have over 40 different uh, event classifications. Um, by understanding that, um, the uh, the company or, or person that the article is uh, is relating to, uh, the location, uh, as well as um, supplementary information such as the, the size of the business, the industry that they work in, we're able to use that information and actually kind of predict an outcome uh, to, to show whether that company is likely to be hiring uh, within the next uh, three to six months. Along with that prediction, we will provide a, a business profile 
Um, so um, basic information about the pro uh, about the business, as well as um, the specific contacts that um, you would need to contact in order to talk about um, those potential future plans. Um, as I said earlier, we're we're also adapting it now to to look at kind of general investment uh, to make the uh, the model more applicable in a in a much wider nature. But it's a it's a very very exciting uh, piece of technology, uh, which I think is is quite unique and and certainly the the thing that attracted me to, to come to this business and, and lead it forward. Um, so that's uh, enough about talent ticker. Um, so looking at, at fintech more specifically. So I think when I when I was asked to do this piece, I was really kind of looking back to to think about you know when when did fintech start. So like looking back at my own history, I, I remember kind of building applications. Uh, so back in maybe 2005, which maybe today we would describe them as as fintech, but it it wasn't really a thing then. So thinking about what really kind of changed things I, I think that the key event was probably the uh, the financial crisis in in 2008 so that really changed a, a lot of things um, so firstly um, it, it, it kind of drove a demand for change so there, there was a lack of trust of that event mainly um, from traditional um, banking providers um, people kind of wanted change they, they saw what had happened didn't understand what happened but you know ultimately there was a, there was a lack of trust. Um, the the service that we'd been getting from um, traditional financial service providers uh, and banking especially was uh, was fairly unchanged. Um, there was a demand for for something more. Interestingly, around the same time, um, Apple had released the the second version of the iPhone, and it was also in July two thousand and eight that the the App Store was invented. And then from that point onwards, we we really we started to talk about apps. We also started to talk about financial apps, and that really kind of what drove that side of it as well. I think um, there was also a demand for for a better integrated experience. So people didn't just want to interact with one financial institution; they wanted their services to to talk together and work together. And I think um, uh, another factor was, was really kind of wanting to get more involved with the process itself, so having accessibility to financial products. So uh, another key event that also happened at that particular time was the, the PPI scandal kind of came to light. I think that was late 2007, 2008. All of these things kind of happened at the same time, which really drove the demand for, for change, the demand for, for something different and allowed these things to, to push on. I also think uh, there were um, some catalysts. Um, so there were probably many catalysts which, which came to play here, but I think uh, there are two in particular I, I want to talk about today. So the first is uh, integration platforms. Uh, one in particular was uh, was produced by a company called MuleSoft. Um, so around about 2010, um, they realized a, a gap in the market. So um, traditional banking systems uh, were, were built on um, fairly old infrastructure uh, with legacy systems. That meant it, it was actually very difficult to to integrate into a bank. Um, there was, uh, in some cases, literally only a few people that could uh, that could change the legacy part of the system, and a, a long, long queue of uh, of uh, activity that that followed it, which made it very hard for a bank themselves to be nimble and uh, and provide change, but also very difficult to to integrate with. MuleSoft kind of saw this as a problem, and they actually integrated a uh, uh, or created a, a connector. So they created a connector for legacy banking systems, which first of all allowed um, banks to be more nimble. So an integration platform is a, is a system that allows uh, you to create APIs and run um, uh, microservices uh, within your own infrastructure. So first of all, that, that freed the banks up. That allowed the banks uh, to go from a, uh, a fairly hard to change organization to something where it was fairly easy to integrate new services in. So it was that point that banks themselves started to go out into the market and look for easier ways to do things. Um, as well as that, from the other side, um, fintech companies could then create kind of uh, additional services and, and find a way to actually integrate with the with the banking infrastructure. So that, that was critical. I think um kind of one of the, the what if one of the things that validates um the you know the the criticality of that is uh, salesforce in uh, in 2018 acquired mulesoft for a, a huge 6.5 billion dollars um the i think the the key points to this is in uh, uh 20 uh, 2018 when it was acquired their projected revenues were were only um 410 i say only that that's still big but the the multiple on that is, is big and it, it might be considered as a uh, a, a bad 
bad financial transaction, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that the sales force knew exactly what they were doing there. Uh, they were buying uh, buying into the, uh, the the product, the functionality, and, and the future potential, which it, which I still think is huge and, and still acts as a quite a backbone to a lot of the integrations that we uh, we can do today. Um, the other thing is uh, is open banking, and and I, I think uh, kind of as Oliver um, commented, uh, we've we've not really kind of got there with open banking. Uh, I think the the potential of what open banking um, could do has has not yet really been realised. But I think the thing that it really did do is it changed the way that um, kind of uh, financial institutions really kind of thought about it, the way that everyone thought about it. So it was no longer going to be something which was kind of restricted to just banks, and and something which which could be open and now we've, we've gone on from um, just talking a, about open banking to actually looking at you know that the term is now open finance and I think open pensions and, and all sorts of things will, will follow on from that so I think that was the start of, of something new um, which really kind of like drives um, future initiatives um, with, within fintech in, in particular. Um, as we're an AI company, I, I thought it would be quite nice to, to talk about uh, AI um, within financial services and, and how it can be applied. So we often also think about AI as, uh, as being a bit of a new thing, but, uh, but actually it's, it's not really new. Uh, so in financial services in particular, a, a company called FICO had uh, introduced a, a predictive model for, for credit scoring. Um, that method for credit scoring is, is really kind of fundamentally the, the same method that's used today. It's, uh, it's progressed quite a way. There's a lot more data that's used and the models are far more advanced, but fundamentally the, the way that it, it is implemented is, is pretty much the same. Um, there are, I've got a, a, a list of examples there um, of uh, how AI is, is currently used in financial services. It's, uh, it's certainly not um, a uh, comprehensive list, but I think kind of really that the way it's implemented is uh, in two categories. So I, I think the, the first use of, of AI is really the the ability for a machine to to process mass amounts of data. Um, so that like un, unlike any person could do, a, a machine is a is able to almost access an infinite amount of uh, of intelligence through data, uh, and it can also do it in uh, in near real time. So for example, uh, in fraud prevention, a a transaction could happen on the on the west coast of America. Um, seconds later, a fraudster could fire another transaction off to uh, a, to a location in in London, they, that person has got no chance of, of understanding the uh, the connection between the two. But a, a machine can certainly understand and process something uh, that quickly to understand that it, it might actually be the same person trying to Im imitate two people and, and commit fraud. Um, so that, I think that that's one purpose where it's really about kind of processing mass data. I think the the other purpose is uh, really where a machine can. So, for example, uh, with chatbots, uh, I think certainly um, many people would argue that a, a person is uh, is a much better kind of process of, uh, of providing uh, online help. However, because a machine can, it, it allows a financial institution to to implement many other things and, and use the people more effectively, channel the conversation in into a, a better use of a, a specialist person. So, I think that that's the other category. So, where where a machine can make the process more more optimal. So just that looking deeper into the use of uh, AI in financial services, I, I think in particular um, the, the use of AI um, and with the regulation for, for financial services, it, it can make it uh, a little tricky. Um, so um, a few other points there to, to kind of talk through. So uh, one of the, the key things is being able to understand like why a particular decision may have been made. So say, for example, someone has uh, applied for a mortgage, um, they're looking to, to, to purchase their dream house, uh, come back with a, a decision kind of generated by a model or machine which, which declines it. The, the person has the right to understand why. Um, the, the difficulty is that it's, it's actually much easier to build an AI-based model that, that is uh, kind of hidden. Um, the, the machine is able to, to look at things in such a complex 
way that it could actually take weeks and weeks for a person to kind of unpick the, the many, many pieces of data that, that led to that particular decision. So the, the mix between the two actually makes it quite a challenge. Um, I think I found the, uh, the from speaking to, to many companies that have used AI within financial services is the the way to really do it to get the most out of, uh, of both worlds is to use the the AI to produce rules. Um, so kind of almost inform you um, which rules you need to apply. So in the in the case of a mortgage, for example, um, the the reason the rule might uh, deduce down to um, person has been in employment less than six months, and that you can explain to a customer, and that's that's how you can overcome. It, but certainly it does it does cause some some challenges to overcome next point is uh, liability um, so um, this has been a, a topical conversation for, for, for many years I, I think now is uh, kind of starting to come to a, a conclusion but the really the, the problem is if a machine makes a decision is really trying to to decide who's liable for it so in the in the chain of, uh, of suppliers so say provide um, for example the the decision making service was provided by a fintech provider is it the person that wrote the code that maybe made a mistake is it the provider the fintech provider that provided a bank with the with the service is it the the way that the service was implemented is it the bank themselves or is it actually the the machine that's at fault if uh, if that can even be a thing i think um from kind of the the many many kind of conversations that, that have happened in this area really it's uh, it's down to the financial institution who chooses to use a particular service who is ultimately liable for for the use of it um which as a uh, a financial services technology provider um, that it does actually make it a little bit easier from that perspective the other aspect is is data privacy um, I think um, GDPR is uh, is a great piece of legislation it is many many years ahead of, uh, of its time and other other countries legislation from that perspective but it does point out kind of some some key things that, that are important um, so from a technological point of view it's it's quite easy to to see the data that you have and and apply it in the way that you think it needs to be applied uh, but, it, but it's very very important to remember like can that data be used for that particular purpose and um it, it's uh, just you know very important to to make sure that 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 is uh, that is correct and i think um the final point which is one which is uh, of particular interest to me is uh, the the issue over copyright and intellectual property rights so very interesting is that a machine cannot own it copyright or or intellectual property so what that means is if you if you rely on a, a ai generated process to to generate something that article that's that's generated would actually be free of copyright um, the the laws as they're currently written can um, only uh, a copyright can only be owned by a person or a, a legal entity not by a machine which uh, which creates an interesting concept another very important thing is uh, is data so um, fundamentally a, a machine is not an intelligent um, uh, piece of uh, equipment um, it's only really gets its intelligence from the data so it's crucially important that the data that goes into any sort of uh, AI produced service is uh, accurate um, so firstly that the data must be uh, representative of of the real world so um, giving a fair representation of, uh, of what um, needs to be predicted. Um, we also need to be very cautious uh, about, about bias in the data. So, for example, um, the, the data and, and unintentionally could contain certain bias, uh, maybe towards a, a certain demographic area, um, which potentially kind of um, might con a machine might conclude using the data that's uh, there that a certain demographic group is either kind of likely or not likely to uh, to do a particular um, thing and that be not respective of, of what would actually happen simply because the the data contained bias towards a particular group so it's very important when you're when data goes in into models and, and into ai that um it's uh, it's checked to make sure that it's fair and not containing any virus towards uh, any particular group or segment um, quite often when when developing AI models um, the the conclusion that the machine comes back with you you can determine yourself that it, it's just not right um, this uh, is a very important part of it so particularly within financial services um, the uh, the conclusions that a machine may come to um, potentially impact people's lives 
and uh, and you wouldn't want to negatively impact them. So I, I think that the combination of uh, of people and assisted learning is really the best thing to do to make sure that the outcomes are right and that it's uh, it's doing the right thing. I think finally the the thing that really you really need to be mindful is that, that a, a person has had a lifetime of uh, of data and and training. They, uh, they also have the ability in many particular ways that the machine just can't um, um, match. So really, um, the, the the ideal solution is is a combination of uh, of the machine used in the ways kind of we we explained in the in the previous slide, uh, and uh, combined with people to get the uh, the best outcome. So I think what's next for, for fintech, so I, I certainly think there'll be a continued adoption for, for AI in, in fintech. I think um, something that I'd also like to see is uh, evolved regulation um, to allow uh, better use of artificial intelligence in, in financial services. I think maybe an area of um, particular interest would be in uh, anti-money laundering, where at the moment the, uh, the, uh, that area of financial services is so well regulated that it actually makes it very hard to be innovative in in that in that space so the uh, the regulation almost indicates kind of exactly how you should do the process and i think uh, a further problem um, which relates to kind of having having the right data or or having the right outcomes in order to to predict the response is that um, financial institutions are required to submit um, suspicious activity in a uh, suspicious activity report to the uh, the national crime agency they submit these reports and uh, may submit many of them but never or, or sh i should say rarely get to hear about the uh, the impact so get don't get to find out whether the uh, the activity that they have reported um, was actually kind of criminal activity or, or whether it was uh, just something that looks suspicious I think the the lack of feedback is really what makes it difficult to, to be innovative particularly in any anti-money laundering and that that's really just down to, to how we've chosen to to regulate it in contrast uh, in in fraud where uh, it's a lot less regulated. Um, the the systems that are put in place are are using AI to to counteract fraud and are are largely quite effective. In AML, um, the the effectiveness of uh, of what what's in place, which isn't really using AI, is really stopping around about one percent of all uh, money laundering. So that there's there could be big improvements in that space in particular using AI uh, with supported regulation to, to allow it happen. I think also in general, um, there'll be uh, lots of further enhancements to, to make our lives easier. I think uh, a lot of focus on, on building stronger systems to, to help keep us safe. So I'd like to, to finish by by just kind of talking about what the what it, I think it means for for fintech in in Wales. So um, currently, as uh, as uh, described by the Khalifa report, which was uh, published in February 2021, uh, Cardiff was identified as as one of the fintech hubs in the UK, uh, which is really attributed to the uh, the masses of homegrown talent from world class uh, universities that we we have close to us. Um, as well as this, a, a number of organisations um, have uh, either expanded in, in Wales, um, particularly Cardiff, or have also moved into the area because of the, the strong nature of, uh, of technology, um, but particularly fintech. Um, the, the thing that I'm wondering now, um, and uh, kind of following the, the pandemic, is, is really like, is, is that going to change? So um, from uh, the, the work that we do within Talent Ticker, uh, working in, in recruitment, what we're, we're seeing is a, a rapid rise of, uh, of uh, roles, which are signaled to be remote roles. So um, companies from all over the UK, or even all over the world, are, are posting jobs, which uh, applicants from this region, so in Cardiff, in, in Wales, are, are applying for and, and even taking. So that, to start with, is it, starting to draw some of the uh, the talent which was based in, in Cardiff and would normally be working locally in Cardiff away from the uh, away from the city. But on the in contrast, what we're also seeing is that uh, um, companies based in this region are also now to, re um, to recruit people uh, outside of, of the city, um, which uh, also has some benefits. Uh, but I think that the, the thing that makes me worry is um, potentially if uh, if we're moving to a, a remote workforce, the the UK is still quite an expensive place to to participate in software development, and there are a lot of other countries, uh, in particular, um, kind of in in Eastern Europe or maybe as as far as South Africa, another English speaking um, country on the same time zone, which would put up some fairly um, tough competition. It would be very interested to to hear anyone else's thoughts on on that subject. Um, but uh, for now, that's uh, 
that's everything for me. Um, thank you, thank you very much. I think, as uh, as Oliver has indicated, um, we uh, we have the chat. Um, we've got some time for for any uh, questions if you if you have them. Thanks for that, Paul. That was that was really really interesting. Um, just I guess maybe we've we've got just about ten minutes left. So um, while we're waiting for any questions to come through on the chat. Um, I, there's a couple of points that I, I'd just like to to touch on from you from your presentation, which I thought were really interesting. One of them was you talked a lot about the kind of ethical challenges and um, some of the, the kind of complications around liability for AI based decision making and things like that. To what extent do you this will The uh, audio has stopped for me just there, Oliver. Sorry. Um, I think yeah, I, I, I heard you up to the point of uh, to what extent do you think? <laughs> to, so yeah, the question was to what extent do you think that these dynamics and the um, kind of uncertainty around liability and some of the ethical challenges, to what extent do you think that they will limit the development of those technologies or limit the um, the way that they're deployed and applied in those industries? Yeah, so I uh, I don't think I, I've seen any kind of um, uh, limitation in any in innovation side of it. So so certainly it's a, it's a topic for debate. Um, but I think yeah. from from the fintech side, it, it's not slowing down the the innovation and the and the production of new ways of doing things. I think by the by the time it, it gets to uh, financial institutions, that's where it starts to become a, a problem. So when um, when they're looking at the implementation of it, the uh, the financial institutions are, are certainly asking like, well, who's liable for this? Um, I think in the early days, um, so going going back from maybe 2016, 2017, that this was more of a problem then. Now, I, I think um, um, financial services companies are generally accepting that they are choosing to take a particular service and they are taking on the liability for the use of the service, uh, be it right or wrong. So they're, they're completely responsible for um for the the use and the decisions that any particular service may make, which I think for yeah. for fintech companies is, is is great news. So you no longer need to to worry about um, potentially huge legal or uh, of financial imp implications from from getting something wrong. That's uh, that's not to say that liability or obligations are completely removed, but I think the focus is really on the. Uh, the financial services institution that that chose to implement it and chose to implement it in in a certain way and and use it against their their range of financial products yeah i mean for me that seems you know the most fair and equitable way that i can kind of see it happening um there's always going to be people who are at risk i guess and there's always going to be a liability that risk that falls somewhere but um yeah that's that's really interesting yeah, I think the the other thing that I was just picking up on is the the your comments about remote working and and we're having this debate um, inside Amplify as well. We're, we're actually recruiting for some positions and we've gone, um, we've decided in many cases to offer it open as a as a one hundred percent remote position if possible uh, or if necessary. Mm. Um, and it 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 certainly has it's a double edged sword, isn't it? I mean, it brings potentially a much wider talent pool that local companies can draw from if you're not asking anybody to relocate and borders and distance is not an issue. But like you say, it does open you up to competition from elsewhere, potentially lower cost um, jurisdictions. Funny that you mentioned the, the South African point, actually. Um, we've we've had a lot of interest, actually, from um, folks from South African country uh, companies and people who've lived in South Africa who've actually, in many cases, made the move to the United Kingdom because of the local situation. So, you know, they mm. felt that the government corruption and the situation in South Africa was actually too dangerous and they've, they've sought to relocate their entire families up to the UK. So, um, yeah, that was just something that, that struck me. You mentioned South Africa, as you say, uh, another English speaking nation, which, of course, has, I think, a lot of transferable talent potential. Um, but it's, it's interesting mm. to see that some of the uh, some of the dynamics that are driving the kind of pandemic response and, you know, lack of accountability and problems with crime and things like that. I'm talking generally here. This is very much generalization, but these are some of the things that some candidates that we've spoken to have actually have actually raised with us and the reason that why they're in the UK or looking to come to the UK. So yeah, that was just a, an, an aside. It's uh, interesting. I, I, I hope so. 
I um I so I I've uh, been kind of living and working in in Cardiff myself since around about 2006. So I, I've seen the the change happen from it being a a fairly untechnical city um, to it becoming a you know a, a great place to to set up a a technical business and particularly a, a fintech business. The uh, the quality of the the candidates that are coming out of the the universities uh, have improved, yeah. and in fact the the courses available within within the universities are, have also improved. Um, you know that there's a, an abundance of, of talent, which is which is really really good. So the the thing that I'm worried about now is is whether, you know, that that might change. Um, mm. Whether the, the uh, you know will we'll be uh, will have the, the strong candidates coming out of the universities, which are now able to get a job any anywhere in the country or, or maybe anywhere in the world. I've, I've heard of stories of of people that are, are telling me, you know, I'm looking for a new position, but I'm only looking for a position in the U.S., which is uh, wow. something that you you just wouldn't have heard a couple of years ago, um, which puts a, a very interesting spin on it um so yeah i i think i like, potentially like cardiff can remain the uh, the fintech hub um but maybe uh the, the way that we employ people will will be different um that could be an advantage i i think um from from our point of view as a as an employer in cardiff uh, we're certainly finding we we now need to do different things we we knew our market in cardiff in south wales we we knew the companies we knew how we needed to market ourselves in in order to make ourselves appealing now we things have changed and they've changed quite quickly from from a local based marketing strategy to to national uh, which is obviously much yeah. much harder yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a similar thing. I mean, we, we haven't been around um, for, you know, for, t for too long, Amplify, but it was a similar thing. There's actually, I, I'm not sure many people know this, but Amplify doesn't really have any connection with Cardiff or South Wales. The co-founders are uh, from the US and, and from England, respectively. Um, but it was actually, they performed a kind of a global assessment, if you like, of where they would like to locate the uh, the company um, five or six years ago. Um, and they, I've seen the document actually, it's quite interesting. They rank lots of different cities like Newcastle, London, Boston, um, places in Silicon Valley, um, Shanghai was in there. Um, and Cardiff on their assessments came out top, you know, and a big part of it was access to talent. Another part was the, some of the government mm. incentives that were available and some of the support that we tapped into. I mentioned the Outlet Accelerator, which we were a part of. Um, and all of these things really combined to, to convince them that Cardiff was a good place to set up the business. So that's what they did. And, and we, we've, we've gone all in now. Um, like I say, we do have we do have people operating elsewhere, notably in the US and in, and in one person in Taiwan, one of our lead machine learning engineers. Um, but it's, it's, it's great to have that flexibility and that freedom to have a, a local HQ um, where we're definitely trying to tap into the local talent, but also have the ability to, um, to, 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 to look elsewhere. Question for Richard, did they do use AI to do the assessment? That's a very good question. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think even our technology was so uh, nascent at that time that it probably wouldn't have given you much detail. Um, it was more of a concept, I think, at the time than, than, than a provable, provable bit of kit. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, like I said, now we've established a position. It's important, I think, to try and maintain that and remain competitive. Mm, yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, one of the things I think I think is going to be a um, one of the other things that I think is going to be a potential benefit from Cardiff is if we have. A real success story, a major success story, whether that be through a massive, you know, a major investment from a big company and, uh, you know, an exit from co-founders or some other marker of success. There's been some, obviously, that have been really, really great for the region. But I think if we can start to get capital flows in this part of the world, in addition to just talent flows, I think that could really take us to the next level. Um, so that's, yeah, that's certainly one thing that, that we're thinking about because, um, you know, Amplify is, is is supported by the Development Bank of Wales, and we, we've also gone overseas for um, for venture capital as well. So we're, we're our principal investor now is based out of Hong Kong, which I, I think again is a, is a great story for for Wales, and we'd like to see more of that. And there, there will be other examples, I'm sure. But I think if we can if we can make a, a noise about the uh, you know kind of world class institutions that are attracted to companies operating in this region, then that will help create a kind of Bit of momentum and a, and a bit of an ecosystem that, that that we can start to build on as well. 
Mm. I think that that's a great point, and to a certain extent, that that's all on us. So the the company is based yeah. in in the region to to promote our activities on on a, a national and uh, and global scale to to make it and keep it successful. So yeah, excellent point. Yeah. Okay, Doc. Well, if there's no further questions, we're just about approaching the 59th minute of the hour. Um, so, yeah, I, unless there's any any other points you wanted to cover off, Paul. Otherwise, I think we can uh, we can start to. Close. No, I think it's uh, it's been great, uh, really enjoyable for uh, for me to to come and speak today, and uh, hopefully it's uh, it's been useful. Yeah, definitely, really insightful presentation. Thank you so much for for coming along and. Um, yeah, similarly for me, it's, it's great to talk to you all and thank you to the team at Technology Connected for putting on a great event. Um, and I think it's been a, a really successful week and, and hopefully we've, we've helped to showcase the best of technology in Wales. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for your participation. Thank you for watching. Rewatch all of our sessions online. Thank you to our partners.